This topic, the devil's dungeon, is really talking about a time when Satan is bound. Satan is bound on this planet with nobody to tempt and manipulate, and he has to look at the consequences of his rebellion for 1,000 years. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Tonight our subject is dealing with the uh, topic of the millennium in the Bible, sometimes known as the thousand years. You find this in Revelation 20. It's called the Devil's Dungeon. If you have your Bible, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to read the first few verses here, and it'll give us the foundation for what we're going to study. I want to make sure everybody understands this very important subject. So if you look there in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. Any question about who the devil, Satan, and dragon are? And bound him for how long? A thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit. What is that? And shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years are finished. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and he'll go out to deceive the nations that are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. All right, we're going to pause right there. With that as a background for our study, now we're going to get into question one of the lesson. You've got the, uh, the picture, and let's learn about this dungeon that the devil is confined to. Question number one in our study. What events mark the beginning of this 1,000-year period? So how do we know? What's the landmarks that begin this time period? You find in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. The second coming of Jesus is when the Lord descends, and it says, and the dead in Christ rise first. Wherever you hear about first, sequentially that means what? Somewhere there is a, a second. And so it's saying, blessed and holy are those that are in the first resurrection. You want to be in the first resurrection, friends. That's the resurrection of the saved. And then you read in Revelation 20, verse 4 and 5, and they lived and reigned with Christ for how long? A thousand years. But it tells us the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Now, you do not find the word millennium in the Bible. Millennium is a composite of two Latin words that simply mean milli, which is a thousand, and annum, which means years. And so the beginning of the 1,000-year period, it starts with what we call the first resurrection, and the end of it is the second resurrection. There are two complete, separate, distinct resurrections. I remember when I first heard this, it kind of surprised me. I thought there was one resurrection at the end of time. The Bible's very clear. Number two, what else will happen in the first resurrection? You read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 through 53, it says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound, and all the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. For this corruptible, it goes on to say, must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Just think about that. Some people will never die. There's already a few people who have never died. Who are they? Just two. Enoch and Elijah. The Bible says Elijah, Enoch walked with God and God took him. Elijah went to heaven in a fiery chariot. 
there are going to be others who are alive when Jesus comes that will never experience death. So what happens? When the Lord comes down, all of a sudden we go through this miraculous, complete, total revitalization where we're transformed and we get these glorified eternal bodies and it just happens in the twinkling of an eye. That's quicker than a blink. You can read more about this answer. It's in Philippians 3, verse 21. It says, Who will change our vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. What kind of bodies do we get? Do we turn into ghosts? Or do we get glorified bodies? What was Jesus' body like when he rose from the dead? Did he tell the disciples to touch him? He was a glorious body. It was a supernatural body, but it was real at the same time. And then he said, do you have anything to eat? I'm hungry. Twice he asked them to feed him. Actually, once he did the cooking. When it was by the seashore. The other. So he's making it clear. He says, I'm not an ethereal ghost. Your glorified body is a real body. When God made Adam and Eve, did they have real bodies? Did he intend them to live forever? Does the Bible say in heaven we're going to plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them and build houses and inhabit them and we'll be doing real things. We're not just going to be strumming harps on a cloud somewhere. So our bodies will be like Jesus' glorified body. And again, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8. Then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the brightness of his coming. So when the Lord comes, the dead in Christ that are dead will be caught up those who are saved will be transformed and caught up. And what happens to those left behind? Just like what happened to the devil. Consumed with the brightness of his coming. Furthermore, Revelation 16, 18, there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. This is going to be a 15 on the Richter scale because it says islands are swallowed up and the mountains are shaked out of their foundations. All right, and it goes on to say, every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a, what? A great hail out of heaven, every stone weighing about a talent. Now see that picture? That's somebody who's holding walnut-sized hail. I did an amazing fact one time to find out what was the largest hail ever recorded. In Bangladesh, they had softball-sized hail. Now that can kill you. But still, that's not 75 pounds. Can you imagine the world being pummeled by that kind of hail? Now, when all these things are happening with the coming of Jesus, this marks the beginning of a period where Satan is bound. Revelation 20, verse 1 and 2. And an angel laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now, how do you bind a devil? I mean, Samson, they tied him up with all different kinds of ropes and he just broke the ropes. You wonder, is Satan stronger than Samson? How do you tie up a devil? If we knew how, we'd all want to do it, wouldn't we? Satan is not being bound by ropes. It's the chain that's being referred to. He says the angel had a great chain in his hand. It's talking about a chain of circumstances. Now, that bottomless pit is a very interesting word and this is what throws people. It comes from a Greek word that you find other places in the Bible. You ever heard the word abyss? It comes from the Greek word abusos. Sounds similar, right? That word abusos, it means the devil is chained where he cannot do anything. It's isolation for him. The same word is used in Luke chapter 8, verse 31. You remember there's this uh, man who's possessed with a legion of demons. And the demons say to Jesus, do not cast us out into the same exact word, abusos. Demons and the devil do not want to be cast into nothingness. The devil wants to possess somebody. He will possess a serpent. The devils in this story possess pigs. They'll possess people. They want to tempt. The devil's a workaholic with nothing to do. It's torture for him. And so the bottomless pit is this planet. For 1,000 years, Satan is going to be bound down here in darkness with his demons, with no humans alive. Why? Because when Jesus comes back, what direction do the dead in Christ go? Oh, the living saints are transformed, and what direction do they go? We will be caught up 
Remember, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again, receive you unto myself that where I am you may be. So we're all going back to the mansions he's prepared when he comes, right? What happens to the wicked who are alive when he comes? The devil and uh, all the devil's going to run from his presence. All the wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. How many people are alive on the planet at that point? Nobody. Who does the devil have to tempt? Him and his demons. They're going to be chained on this dark planet. Question number three. In what condition will the earth be left after this devastating earthquake and hailstorm that begin the 1,000 years? Let's let the Bible explain itself. Isaiah 24, verse 19. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty. He makes it waste. He turneth it upside down. The earth is utterly broken down. How many people are on the earth? It's empty. Read now in Jeremiah 4, verse 23. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form, and boy, now you read that, you might think, oh, he's talking about creation, because it's the same wording, but it's not what he's talking about. Keep reading. I beheld in the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled. And there was no man, all the birds of heaven were fled. The fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. What was the condition of Israel after Nebuchadnezzar came and left? Desolate, cities broken down. Didn't we just read that? Read Jeremiah 25, verse 33. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. Is that clear? They shall not be lamented, neither ga gathered nor buried. Why is there nobody to gather them or to bury them? Because there's nobody alive. Now, I'll tell you why this is such an important subject. I need both hands. I've got to put down my clicker for this. Many dear Christians believe the Tim LaHaye left behind scenario of final events, which say, and again, we may just respectfully disagree, but they say that the secret rapture takes place seven years before Jesus actually touches the earth. They go back to heaven, great tribulation, people still alive on earth during the tribulation. Then at the end of that time, Jesus comes down and the millennial reign is here on earth and then at the end of that millennial reign, the wicked are slain, and we just occupy the earth. In that scenario, where is the earth completely vacated from all life? It doesn't fit. It never happens. It, it doesn't fit the scheme in the Bible of what it's describing. And so this is what Protestants used to believe for about 1,500 years, and it's getting eclipsed by Hollywood productions now tells us that the slain of the Lord covered the earth. There is no man. I turn the earth upside down. It's utterly empty. The cities are all broken down. They've all fled from the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. There's no one to lament or bury them or mourn. They're all gone. But we're living and reigning with Christ. Satan is bound on this planet. You know, in the, um, the Greek Old Testament, uh, it's the same Old Testament as Hebrew, except it's in Greek, called the Septuagint, when it says the earth is void, it uses the word abusos. It calls this planet the same thing. And that verse in Jeremiah uses the word abusos. The earth is an, was an abyss. Satan is bound on this planet with nobody to tempt and manipulate. And he has to look at the consequences of his rebellion for 1,000 years. That's a long prison sentence. All right, number four. Where will the saints be during the 1,000 years and what will they be doing? All right, now we're going to jump to heaven. It's going to be a prettier picture. John 14, verse 3, Jesus said, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you might be also. He's taking us to where he is, where he's told his disciples he was going. Is it clear we're going up? Yet the left behind scenario says that we spend the millennium here on earth reigning over the wicked. I don't know about you, but I have no aspirations to reign over the wicked. Uh, that would be really strange. Think about that. 
that the righteous are here on earth, they've got glorified bodies, and they're reigning over the wicked that still marry, have babies, and die. It just, it, it just seems uh, really strange to make that fit. Revelation 20, verse 4. What are we doing in heaven when it says we live and reign with Christ? It tells us in the Bible. I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and they lived and they reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now what does judgment mean? Does that mean that we're up there going, innocent, guilty, innocent, guilty? Who are we judging? Keep reading. It tells us. 1 Corinthians, this is Paul, chapter 6, verse 2. Do you not know, and verse 3, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? You know, we're, as Christians, going to be persecuted by the world. We're going to be judged. There'll be a death decree on us. But before that happens, Jesus is going to come and rescue us, and the tables are going to turn. That means Paul will someday be sitting in judgment of Nero, who declared that Paul should be beheaded. Won't that be interesting? So God is just. All right, question number five. What will happen at the close of the 1,000 years? Several things. Behold, it says, and now I'm in Zechariah 14, verse 1, 4, 5, 9. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And it says, the Mount of Olives will cleave in the midst thereof. The night we studied the second coming, if anybody comes along and they say, I'm Jesus, if his feet are touching the ground, he's not Jesus, because when Jesus' feet touch the ground, he's coming to the Mount of Olives and it's going to split and form a great valley. Now why does that happen? Revelation 21 verse 2, it's in your lesson. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is a great marriage supper where finally the end of that 7,000 year period takes place. This all happens at the end of that 1,000 years. The new Jerusalem comes down. That is the good Jerusalem, city of peace. All right, so when that happens, what happens next to now free Satan from his prison? You read in um, uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, we already touched on this, but we're going to read it again. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. What does that imply? After the thousand years are finished, what happens? They live again. You know what else we read? After the thousand years are finished, Satan is loose from his prison. What is it that looses Satan from his prison? All the wicked dead who have ever lived are going to come back to life. He's now got this vast army again that's always listened to him before. They're ready and able to listen to him again. So, what will Satan do when the wicked are raised? Revelation 20, verse 8 and 9, it says, He will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea, and it goes on to say, they went up on the breadth of the earth and they compassed the camp of the saints about the beloved city. Ezekiel talks about Gog and Magog coming against the people of God. Gog and Magog, you read in Genesis, they are some of the ancestors of the tribes that fought against Israel. They represent the enemies of Israel. Gog, Magog means from the matrix or the children of Gog. Gog was a warlike nation that fought against Israel. Magog meant and the children of Gog. So I've heard people say, oh, it's Russia and China. And Revelation is not talking about those kind of battles of nations. It's talking about the battle between good and evil, Christ and Satan, those who follow him and those who don't. Revelation, it talks about Babylon, the mother of harlots and her daughters, Gog and Magog. You've got the wicked and their children, it talks about, and that's all that's saying. They, it says, they cover the earth like a cloud. Can you imagine just the swarms of humanity all over the planet? And those in the city, it's going to look pretty ominous for us. Number six, at this crucial moment, what will stop everything? Revelation 20, 
verse 11 and 12. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Who are the dead that are being judged at this judgment? That's the wicked. They're dead spiritually. Jesus said, if you have the Son, you have life. If you don't have the Son, you do not have life. And so during that time when they prepared to launch this assault on the city of God, Jesus is exalted above the city. This battle is paused. The Lord will make every person's life to pass before them. In the heavens where all can see above the new Jerusalem, they'll see Jesus coming into the world. They'll see his perfect life. They'll see that he taught everybody what they need to do to be saved. They'll see Jesus' sufferings at the hands of Lucifer and the way that the devil was so filled with this love for power and Jesus was so filled with the power of love. What will happen next? After God shows the issues, shows people their sins, shows his goodness, everyone bows down and they say, Jesus is Lord. Even the devil will finally be constrained by the justice of God to bow down and declare that Jesus is Lord. It'll be harder for him than anyone. And at that point, the devil jumps back to his feet and he said, it's our last chance. Take the city. They come against the city of God. Tells us in Revelation 20 verse 9, at that point God has no alternative, does he? Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. Again, Revelation 20 verse 15, and it tells us, whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. As that fire rains down around the New Jerusalem, New Jerusalem's got big walls. It's safe. Even though it's molten outside the city, everyone inside is safe. And all the wicked are going to be punished according to what they deserve. And anyone not found in the book of life is thrown into the lake of fire. The Bible says this is the second death. So quickly, and that's by the way, Revelation 20 verse 14. Let's review what happens now uh, to mark out the millennium. We'll just put a little chart up on the screen to give you the quick picture of how do you separate this period of time. At the beginning of the 1,000 years, you have the first resurrection and the second coming, right? And then at the end, it's the second resurrection and the holy city comes down. During the 1,000 years, the righteous are in heaven. We're looking at the books. We're asking questions. We're judging so that when the judgment happens, we are all in agreement saying true and righteous are his judgments. And then after the 1,000 years, fire comes down. There, it's called the executive part of the judgment when people receive their penalties. After the fire goes out, what will God do for his people at that time? Do we continue treading on ashes? Or does the Bible say, Isaiah 66, 17, Behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. We will get to see him making this new heaven and this new earth. Amen? Won't that be exciting? And then read also Revelation 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And the Lord wants you in that city, friends. 2 Peter 3, verse 13. But we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. We will get to watch Jesus making the world all over again, even more beautiful than before because he's going to give us an upgrade. God himself will dwell with us. Amen? Where will God and the righteous finally live? Revelation 21, verse 3. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. God is going to live with us. Instead of this just being another world, the Lord is moving the capital of the universe to this planet and that's why we will reign with Christ. Won't that be wonderful, friends? At this point, all of this is, is behind us. The meek will inherit the earth. The question is, where will we be? The Lord has brought you to these meetings. You're watching now. You're here now because he wants you to accept his gift of everlasting life that he's offering. He has a special plan for your life that he can only mobilize and activate when he returns and when you surrender your life to him. He can begins now. Would you like to make that decision tonight, friends? You can have that. We don't have to fear all the pain and the darkness in this world if we give our lives to Jesus. 
Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back with this week's special free offer. Can't get enough Amazing Facts Bible Study? You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Visit the Amazing Facts Media Library at AFTV.org. At AFTV.org, you can enjoy video and audio presentations as well as printed material all free of charge, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Visit AFTV.org. Did you know this boat could share the gospel with 20,000 people? Or a car like this one could reach 10,000 souls seeking hope in Jesus? If you have a vehicle you're not using and would like to reach hearts for the kingdom of God, prayerfully consider donating your vehicle to Amazing Facts today. It's easy to turn your unneeded car, boat, RV, motorcycle, even ATVs and jet skis into a soul-winning vehicle for Christ and get a tax deduction. Amazing Facts will arrange to pick up your vehicle and provide you with a tax-deductible receipt. The proceeds from the resale will be used to share God's truth with millions of people around the world. Don't leave your vehicle in the garage collecting dust. Use it to transform lives through Amazing Facts. Contact us today and let us help turn your car, boat, RV, or motorcycle into lives saved for Christ. Together, we have spread the gospel much farther than ever before. Thank you for your support. For life-changing Christian resources, visit afbookstore.com. The Bible talks in Revelation 20 about a very interesting period of time, better known as the 1,000 years or the millennium. It's a time that's coming very soon. The Bible says it's a time where we will live and reign with the Lord. The question is, where do we spend the millennium? Is it here on earth? Is it in heaven? What's the condition of the wicked during this time? Would you like to understand this subject that's coming very soon? We have a study guide called A Thousand Years of Peace that explains it all. To get your free copy, go to amazingfacts.org or call the number on your screen and ask for offer number 123. And friends, when you receive this free resource, please read it and then share it with a friend. We want to get the word out because God's message is our mission. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. A lot of people in our world, even in our churches, that have been seduced by spirits, they're deceived. And they say, well, I know what the Bible says, but I had this spirit tell me. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. I don't know if you've uh, been to Paris before. They've got a tourist attraction there that is a little bit grisly. It's the catacombs of Paris. Unlike the catacombs in Rome, where it shows where the Christians uh, uh, lived and some of the burial areas, but in the catacombs of Paris, they basically had a problem with finding new graves shortly after the French Revolution because, you know, they were just, so many people were butchered with a guillotine. They were just, they couldn't manage all the graves and it became unsanitary. Well, there were all these ancient catacombs under Paris, and so they began to stack up the bodies, the remains of six million Parisians in 190 miles of tunnels. And there are about 160,000 tourists that visit Paris every year and they go down into these catacombs and they wind down this spiral staircase and they got tour guides and most of it obviously is blocked off. And they got the one guy that works there and he... Um, they said, Don't, doesn't this bother you, all these spirits surrounded by all the ghosts of all these bones? 
And he said, well, it made me feel a little bit creepy at first, but he says, now the bones kind of fall off and I pick them up and stick them back in. He said, you know, you just get used to it after a while. How'd you like to have that job? <laughs> but do you really need to worry about walking through a cemetery and the people spooking you? I heard one time this, you know, people put some interesting things on their tombstones. And it's an education to walk through a cemetery. And this one man, uh, he put on his tombstone, stop my friend as you go by, as I am now, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you soon shall be. So prepare yourself to follow me. Well, a schoolboy was walking through the cemetery and he stopped and he looked at that writing on the tombstone and he scribbled with crayon. He said, to follow you, I'm not content until I know just where you went. <laughs> and that's really the big question. Where do they go? What happens to people when they die? Jesus gives us some encouraging words in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 18. He says, I am he that lives. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death, of hell and death. Now, the word hell there in the Bible represents the grave. He says, I've got the keys of the grave and death. We don't need to be afraid of death. If you understand this subject, you'll come to find that Christians do not really die. They go to sleep. Let's find out what the Bible says. Let's get into our study. Question number one. To understand the subject of death, we've got to go back to the beginning and look at what happened when God first made man. How did we get here in the first place? It says in Genesis 2, verse 7, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You notice it does not say that God gave man or injected him with a soul. The combination of the breath of life and the dust of the earth that the Lord assembled, man then became a living soul. Don't miss that. When God first made Adam, and he put all the positions, the, the organs in their place, and there was blood in Adam's veins, but his heart was not beating, and he had a set of lungs, but they were not breathing. Then it says God breathed into him that breath of life. Question number two, what happens when a person dies? Basically, it's creation in reverse. You read in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, then the dust, the body, will return to the earth as it was. We know what happens when you die, you decompose. And it says, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So what is this spirit that returns to God at death? Is it a ghost that hops out of you? It says in Job, all the while my breath is in me and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. Well, I bet you never thought about it that way before. You got a soul up your nose, the spirit of God in your nostrils. What does that mean? It's the word there, spirit, is the Hebrew word roach. And it means the breath of God is in my nostrils. The word breath and spirit are interchangeable many times in the Bible. In Hebrew, it's roach. The word often translated spirit in Greek is pneuma. And so the word pneuma means breath. And so a lot of people have translated spirit. It's just the word breath. And I think it means a ghost jumps out of you. Again, the body without the spirit is dead. That word there, spirit, in James chapter 2, is breath. The body without the breath is dead. Everything breathes in our world. Even fish breathe. Mushrooms breathe. There is no life without breath. Every single cell of life in our world uses the gases of air somehow. They breathe or they die. So what is a soul then? Bible talks about soul, and everybody thinks it's a little butterfly ghost, some kind of pink cotton candy that comes out of you. Uh, it's this, uh, you know, ethereal creature. Um, that's not what the Bible teaches. What is the soul? Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. We're going to review this. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a soul. The combination of the two things becomes a soul. Let's suppose for a moment here I've got a box, just a little wooden box. It's a combination of wood and nails. And I put the wood and the nails together and I make a box. Two components, wood and nails, box. So 
I now take my hammer and I pull out the nails and I set them over here and I take the little pieces of board, the wood, and I set them over here. I've still got the nails, I've still got the wood. Where's the box? The box stops being a box when you separate the two. That's the way it is with you being a soul. When you separate the breath of life from the body, it stops being a soul. Your soul experiences everything your soul experiences in your body. So the idea that you got a little ghost inside you that goes flitting around after you die, you don't find that in the Bible. Question. Big question. Do souls die? Can a soul die? Some people say, no, your soul's immortal. Let's find out what the Bible says. Ezekiel 18, verse 4, the soul that sins, can you see what that says? It shall what? The soul that sins, it shall die. The penalty for sin is death. Only the Lord has immortality. So you don't have an immortal soul. Matter of fact, you can read in Revelation 16, speaking about one of the plagues, it says, and every soul in the sea died. There the word soul is speaking about every living creature. And so when it says in Ecclesiastes, the body returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it, what is that spirit that returns to God? Every creature in the world gets its life from God. And when any creature dies, the life returns to God who gave it. It doesn't mean that it's up there having a conversation. The butterflies and the fish are all talking to each other. They all got these little ghosts. It's just talking about the power of life returns to God who gave it. And we read a lot of things and superstitions into the Bible. It's not there. Do good people go to heaven right when they die? Here's what the Bible says. Job 17, 3. If I wait, the grave is my house. They sleep a dreamless sleep in the grave. And again... Men and brethren, Peter speaking, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and that his tomb is with us to this day. Now, I'm speaking about good King David, you know, the one who killed Goliath. How many of you believe, if you know your Bible at all, that David will be saved? David's going to be saved. David died 3,000 years ago, 1,000 years before Christ. Good man, good king. Uh, here Peter is preaching right now at Pentecost a thousand years later. After the cross, after Jesus has ascended to heaven, and he said, let me tell you about King David, that he is dead and buried and his grave is still with us to this day. They could look and see where his grave was, right there outside Jerusalem. Still there today. I've been there. Reading on, Peter says, for David is not ascended into the heavens. Now, I don't know how more clear the apostle can be when he says he's dead, he's buried, his grave is with us, and he's not in heaven. So, if good King David is not in heaven yet, and Jesus has had 3,000 years to get him there, then maybe we don't go there until a future time. Let's keep reading. When is that time? John chapter 5, these are the words of Jesus, verse 28. When the Lord comes back, it says, all that are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. There's a resurrection. How many of you knew there was a resurrection? People don't come out of their graves until the resurrection. That's the purpose of the resurrection. How much does one comprehend after death? I mean, don't you die and then at least you're in limbo or purgatory or Abraham's bosom. We've got all these places we've concocted where people kind of, it's a waiting room for heaven or hell. Uh, and the Bible doesn't teach that. Show me the word limbo in the Bible. Purgatory, where is that in the Bible? It's not there, is it? These are just man-made things. Ecclesiastes 9, 5, 6, 10, uh, several places you can look. Do you believe the Bible, friends? Here's what it says. The dead know not anything. Couldn't be more clear than that. It's like a dictionary definition. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Under the sun means in this life. Once a person dies, they don't come back to haunt anybody. They don't know anything. They have nothing to do at all with anything that's going on in this world. Again, speaking of the dead, it says, His sons will come to honor, and he knows it not. They are brought low, and he perceives it not of them. In other words, when a person dies, they're not up in heaven looking down on their family. First of all, would you be very happy up in heaven if uh, 
you could look down and see all the trouble that your family's having and your, maybe your kids are going through. I mean, would you be enjoying the bliss of heaven when you see all the tragedy and misery on this world? It says the people in heaven have no more pain, no more sorrow. They're not going through all that agony of watch, watching what's happening down here. They are sleeping a peaceful, dreamless sleep. Now, some of them are thinking right now, Pastor Doug, what about that verse there in 1 Corinthians, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Well, that's absolutely true. If you're saved and you die, your next conscious thought is the presence of the Lord. Jesus called unconsciousness, the unconscious state of the dead, sleep in John 11, verse 11 to 14. How long will they sleep? It says, so man lies down and he rises not till the heavens be no more. Now we read this one to you a moment ago. When is it when the heavens are no more? The day of the Lord will come in which the heavens pass away. So they sleep until the heavens are no more. They sleep until the heavens pass away. That's when the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. So it's at the coming of the Lord the dead will rise. They're not risen yet. As far as they're concerned, they have no consciousness of time. The resurrection happens as soon as they die because it's the next thing they know. But we live in time. Has it happened yet? For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So everyone dies in Adam. We've all got these physical bodies. Adam died. God say, in the day you eat thereof you will die. Adam began dying spiritually and even began dying physically the day that he sinned. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, here's the order. This is New Testament. When do they raise? Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ, what does it say? At his coming. When do they rise? We all die. But afterward, they that are Christ, at his coming, that's when they come back to life. If that's clear, say amen. amen. That's so clear to me. Jesus made it so clear. He said, Our friend Lazarus is asleep. And then he later explained when the disciples said, well, good, he's sick, sleep, that'll be good for him. He said, no, no, Lazarus is dead. Jesus said, I'm speaking in symbolic terms. Lazarus is dead. Later he goes to the tomb to raise Lazarus. He'd been dead four days. And Martha wanted to, she said, Lord, it's not going to be pleasant. He said, roll away the stone. And she said, by this time there's a bad smell because he's been dead four days. You know, it's so death is not a pretty thing. And he, she said, he's not going to smell. It's going to be awful, Lord. He said, roll away the stone. Trust me. And they rolled away the stone. It probably stunk when they did. But then Jesus said, when he said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. All of a sudden, in the dark opening of that tomb, this figure came waddling out, bound up with these mummy-like cloths. And Jesus said, loose him. Lazarus was alive. Now, here's a question. A lot of the Christian world teaches today that when you die, you go right to heaven or hell, before the judgment, before the resurrection. Have you heard that? That is a false teaching. It doesn't matter how popular it is. It is unbiblical. And if nothing else, use your head. Think. There are about 12 resurrections in the Bible. If one person was resurrected in the world today, a bona fide resurrection, dead and buried four days, doctors declared them dead, 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 cold, lifeless, dead, no brain waves, buried them. Four days later, they open the grave, they stink, and all of a sudden they come back to life. Would you have every news agency in the world sending reporters, and they would be shoving microphones in their face and saying, what was it like on the other side? What did you see? What did you experience? Right? How come out of the 12 resurrections in the Bible, not one of them ever comments on what they experienced in death? Because they didn't experience anything. I mean, can you imagine what a dirty trick that would be? Here, Lazarus dies. He's up in heaven. He's with the angels. He's getting reaching out for the tree of life. And all of a sudden, poof, he's back in grave clothes. And he thanks Jesus. I really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd raise you because you're my friend. Bring you back. Give you your old body again. Would that have been? Or, I mean, you know, if he was burning in hell and Jesus brought him back, you'd say, oh, boy, it was hot. Thanks a lot. But he makes no comment at all about anything. Why? Because they knew back then the dead don't know anything. They're asleep. It's a dreamless, unconscious sleep. Doesn't matter how popular the other teachings are, they're not biblical friends. What happens to the righteous dead at the second coming of Jesus? 
It says in 1 Corinthians 15, will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. Speaking of the trump when the Lord descends. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. Speaking of the saved dead. They're the ones in the first resurrection. For this corruptible, this old body, it's not going to be there. It must put on incorruption, the glorified body. And this mortal, we're mortal now, will put on immortality. When do we get immortality? When the Lord comes. Our bodies aren't immortal yet. What was the devil's first lie? First lie that the devil told in the Garden of Eden. He said to Eve, you shall not surely die. God said, you eat the forbidden fruit and you'll die. There's two choices that God has given people. He so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him might not perish, die, but have everlasting life. It's life or death. That's what salvation is all about. Life or death. He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son has not life. See, the devil says you either live forever in hell or you live forever in heaven because you're immortal. The Bible doesn't teach that. We got life or death that we get to choose. The dragon said you'll not really die. You'll be transformed into a ghost or you'll be reincarnated. He's got all these other theories. That old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He's a serpent. That's what the dragon said to Eve. You don't really die. Does the devil still say that today? You know what's sad? The devil is saying it today through many pulpits around the world. But people don't really die. They turn into ghosts or spirits or angels or they're reincarnated or they channeled somewhere else in some other universe and uh, there's no limit to the theories. Number eight. Why did the devil lie to Eve about death? Could this subject be more important than many people think? And when they say unto you, seek those that have mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter. People go to get a soothsayer. They go to get someone who will channel uh, an occultist, uh, a medium to call back the dead, to communicate. God says, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? God is saying, why are you trying to talk to the dead? And yet, the heart culture is just full of this. Some depart from the faith, Paul said, 1 Timothy 4.1, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. A lot of people in our world, even in our churches, that have been seduced by spirits, they're deceived. And they say, well, I know what the Bible says, but I had this spirit tell me. And a lot of folks, and some who don't even believe in God, somehow believe in ghosts. You help me figure that out. They don't believe in God, but they believe the dead somehow can communicate. They believe in spiritism is what it is. Life after death. Science is search for the meaning of near-death experiences. You've heard of near-death experiences. Sometimes they're called NDEs. Person dies on the um, operating table. Ostensibly dies. Supposedly they die. Their heart stops beating. And so the brain is not getting oxygen. And then they have this experience where they, they come out of their body and they, they then begin to hover above the operating table and they can kind of hear what's going on. And they're having all kinds of weird experiences. Some doctors did some research on this regarding carbon dioxide and out-of-body experiences, OBEs here. In one experiment, Dr. Ladislas Maduna administered 30% carbon dioxide and 70% oxygen to a subject. Afterward, the subject stated, I felt as though I was looking down at myself, as though I was way out here in space. I felt sort of separated. Well, the guy didn't die. You show me someone gets their head cut off and comes back. I'll be impressed. That's not what happens. Their heart stops beating is typically what happens. Do devils really work miracles? It says, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles. And again, he says, I will go forth and I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. Can devils perform signs and wonders and miracles? Can they deceive? It says, there will arise in the last days false Christs and false prophets. And they do what? They show great signs and wonders. Inasmuch that if it were possible, they would deceive even the very elect. God is saying, look, I've told you beforehand. So why do we need to understand this subject in the last days? Because the devil is going to use the misunderstanding about death to deceive many people. By thy sorceries, Revelation 18, 23, were all nations deceived. 
heard a story about um, a woman who was, I think, living in San Francisco at the time during the Vietnam War. She had a son over there. Son was not a Christian, anything but. And then one day she got a very tragic note in the mail. It said uh, when she opened it up, she started to shake because she knew it was from the State Department. It said, um, we regret to inform you that your son is missing in action and presumed dead. Uh, she was just totally devastated, her only son. And it really hurt her because she was a good Christian. And by all outward ex experience, it seemed like he had died lost. And then one day, while she was in her bedroom weeping, all of a sudden, her son appeared. And he was there and he said, Mom, and he's in this glowing robe. He said, you, I've seen you. I've been watching you. You're crying over me and you don't need to cry anymore. He said, I'm okay. And so she didn't know what to think. She said, son, she went to lunge for him and hug him. She said, you can't touch me. He said, but I want you to know that you don't need to worry, but you weren't a Christian. She said, God is merciful. He saves everybody. And she said, well, but that's not what the Bible says. Well, these warnings are in the Bible to encourage people to live right. But God is merciful. Nobody's going to hell. No one will be lost. And he began to tell her all these things that were contradicting the Bible. And she was so confused. And he appeared to her several times. And it made her feel good to see him. It gave her comfort to see this apparition. But it was so, and she was a leader in her church. She didn't know what to do. And then one day she heard a knock at the door and she opened the door and there's her son again. He said, now he's in a uniform and his arm is in a sling. And she said, why are you appearing at the door? And why are you wearing this uniform? And he said, Mom, what are you talking about? Aren't you glad to see me? It was her real son. <laughs> he wasn't really dead. Evidently, the, the devils got their computer software crashed or something. They messed up and they started impersonating her son. It wasn't really dead. <laughs> she saw something, but it wasn't her son. And he had been working on her to deceive her about what the Bible really said, eroding the teachings of the Bible. Are you thankful for the Bible truth? that teaches us the truth on this sensitive subject of death. You know, I'm so glad you can say with um, Apostle Paul that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. Jesus said, I am he that lives. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And he's got the keys of death and hell. We're finishing where we started. He's got those keys of life and he's offering them to you and me. That's good news, friends. Nobody's up there haunting you. People don't get their, their rewards until the Lord comes back. The Bible says that because Jesus rose again, we can rise again. He is the resurrection and the life. If you've got Jesus, you've got life. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with this week's special offer. Can't get enough Amazing Facts Bible study? You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Visit the Amazing Facts Media Library at AFTV.org. At AFTV.org, you can enjoy video and audio presentations as well as printed material all free of charge, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Visit AFTV.org. Did you know this boat could share the gospel with 20,000 people? Or a car like this one could reach 10,000 souls seeking hope in Jesus. If you have a vehicle you're not using and would like to reach hearts for the kingdom of God, prayerfully consider donating your vehicle to Amazing Facts today. It's easy to turn your unneeded car, boat, RV, motorcycle, even ATVs and jet skis into a soul winning vehicle for Christ and get a tax deduction. Amazing Facts will arrange to pick up your vehicle and provide you with a tax deductible receipt. The proceeds from the resale will be used to share God's truth with millions of people around the world. Don't leave your vehicle in the garage collecting dust. Use it to transform lives through amazing facts. Contact us today and let us help turn your car, boat, RV, or motorcycle into lives saved for Christ. Did you know that Noah was present at the birth of Abraham? Okay, maybe he wasn't in the room but he was alive and probably telling stories about his floating zoo. From the creation of the world to the last day events of Revelation, BibleHistory.com is a free resource where you can explore major Bible events and characters, enhance your knowledge of the Bible, and draw closer to God's Word. Go deeper. Visit the amazing Bible timeline at BibleHistory.com. Perhaps you heard it said, that if you live long enough, you'll die. 
But no one really wants to talk about death. Death is that proverbial elephant in the room. Some people believe that when you die, well, you take on some new essence or you enter a new form. Perhaps you're reincarnated as another person. Others believe that when you die, you turn into fertilizer and you're dead. What's the truth about this important subject that everybody will face someday? What does the Bible teach? Would you like to know? Amazing Facts has a free offer that will give you what the scriptures really teach on the subject of death, and it's called, Are the Dead Really Dead? We would encourage you to send for this because we'll send it to you for free. Just simply go to our website, amazingfacts.org, or call the number on the screen and ask for offer number 117. I can promise you, you'll never be the same and you will be encouraged and comforted by this study. And that's why we do what we do here at Amazing Facts, because God's message is our mission. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request.